during the Ring period of Taiyuan of the Jin Dynasty from 326 to 97 AD. There lived in Wuling a certain fisherman. One day, as he followed the course of a stream, he became unconscious of the distance he had traveled. All at once, he came upon a grove of blossoming peach trees which lined either bank for hundreds of paces. No tree of any other kind stood amongst them, but there were fragrant flowers, delicate and lovely to the eye, and the air was filled with drifting peach bloom. The fisherman, marveling, passed on to discover where the grove would end. It ended at a spring, and there came a hill. Inside of the hill was a small opening which seemed to promise a gleam of light. The fisherman left his boat and entered the opening. It was almost too cramped at first to afford him passage, but when he had taken a few dozen steps, he emerged into the open light of day. He faced a spread of level land. Imposing buildings stood amongst rich fields and pleasant ponds all set with mulberry and willow. Linking path led everywhere, and the fowls and dogs of one farm could be heard from the next. People were coming and going and working the fields. Both the men and the women dressed in exactly the same manner as people outside. White-haired elders and tufted children alike were cheerful and contented. Some, noticing the fisherman, started in great surprise and asked him where he had come from. He told them his story. They then invited him to their home, where they set out wine and killed chickens for a feast. When news of his coming spread through the village, everyone came in to question him. For their part, they told how their forefathers, fleeing from the troubles of the age of Qin, had come with their wives and neighbors to this isolated place, never to leave it. From that time on, they had been cut off from the outside world. They asked what age was this because they have never even heard of the Han, let alone its successors, the Wei and the Jin. The fisherman answered each of their questions in full, and they sighed and wondered at what he had to tell. The rest all invited him to their homes in turn, and in each house, food and wine were set before him. It was only after a stay of several days that he took his leave. Do not speak of us to the people outside, they said. But when he had regained his boat and was retracing his original route, he marked it point after point. On reaching the prefecture, he saw audience of the prefect and told him of all these things. The prefect immediately dispatched officers to go back with the fisherman. He hunted for the marks he had made, but grew confused and never found the way again. The learned and virtuous hermit Liu Ziji heard the story and went off elated to find the place, but he had no success and died at the length of a sickness. Since that time, there had been no further secrets of the ford. Thank you for tuning in to The Global Novel. I'm Claire Hennessy. What you've just heard is a short prose fable called Peach Blossom Spring, written by China's best-known poet during the Sixth Dynasty period, Tao Yuanming. Joining us today is Dr. Wendy Swartz, professor of Chinese literature at Rutgers, to share her knowledge with us on the subject. Professor Swartz is the author of Reading Tao Yuanming, Shifting Paradigms of Historical Reception, and another book called Reading Philosophy, Writing Poetry, and Her Textual Modes of Making Meaning in Early Medieval China. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you very much, Claire, for having me here. It's a, my pleasure, and um, it's it's always fun to talk about Tao Yuanming. Right. First of all, could you tell us who Tao Yuanming was? Yes, I would love to. He was one of China's most beloved poets and has remained so. He was most likely born in 365 and he died in 427. He served in government office for about 13 years and serving in government office at the time was the main career for all educated men. He withdrew from office when he was about just 40 years old and lived out the rest of his life in what was considered reclusion as a gentleman farmer. He wrote mostly about his life in retirement, including his daily activities, as well as about his philosophy of reclusion. During his lifetime, he was in fact not considered a major poet. It was only in the centuries after his death that he acquired the stature that he has today. Right. And after his death, 
he came to represent four Chinese readers, three exemplars. Number one, he was the eccentric recluse because he supposedly quit office、uh, because he refused to don the formal, proper attire to meet an inspector sent to his district. He allegedly said, "I refuse to bend at the waist for a mere five pecks of rice." He was also an ethical hero to many, because he quit office before the change in dynasty and cryptically wrote about that dynastic change. So later readers saw in this act as、um, a show of loyalty for not serving two rulers. For others, still, he was the lofty transcendent. Some believe that he transcended the mundane, including politics altogether. So the logical conclusion to this attitude can be seen in the early 20th century, when one prominent scholar claimed that although Tao Yuanming experienced extreme poverty and hunger after he withdrew from office and gave up his steady income, such deprivation surely did not bother such a lofty man. So. As the stature of Tao Yuanming's person grew, so did appreciation for his poetry. For the last millennium, he has been considered a poet with few parallels in China. Today, there is a subfield in Chinese literature devoted to studying Tao Yuanming and his works, much like Shakespeare studies in English literature. Right? Could you please let us know how a recluse was defined? What did a recluse look like in Tao Yuanming's time, and how do the ways of a recluse help us understand the ideological and cultural climate of the poet's time? Broadly speaking, a recluse in pre-modern China referred to someone who qualified for government service by virtue of their education, their class, and abilities, but they chose instead to withdraw from or shun that kind of active public life. In Tao Yuanming's era, the early medieval period, roughly from the third to the sixth、uh, century,、mm-hmm. reclusion had especially interesting and peculiar features. Reclusion then was not necessarily defined against government service. Medieval writers introduced the crafty concept of recluse at court, which meant reclusion was defined by one's state of mind or one's intent. So, in other words, if a court official was lofty-minded, detached, and transcendent, then he could lay claim to practicing a reclusion of sorts, even while serving at court. So, as a side note, this, of course, had the advantage of maintaining the respectability of being a government official and collecting a steady salary. All the while maintaining the reputation of being a lofty transcendent. So, in short, to be considered a recluse in medieval China, one did not need to hide out in the mountains like a hermit and lead an ascetic life. So, I think this is one of the most important distinctions between the concept and practice of reclusion in China and in the West. In medieval China. A、reclusion was less about place. That is to say, where you are physically. It was more about the state of mind or intent. In other words, where you are mentally or spiritually. Another interesting feature of medieval reclusion was the social aspect of it. Contrary to the popular perception of a recluse as a hermit living an obscure ascetic life away from others. Recluses were often famous and sought after in medieval China. Tao Yuanming, in particular, was well known in his locale as an eccentric, lofty-minded recluse. There are anecdotes about how gentrymen and officials sought his company, and would lure him with food and wine, for they knew how much he loved wine above all. That's right. The fact that Tao Yuanming being a drunkard is both an interesting and baffling fact. He was reportedly to be drunk while tending his farm. He seldom accepted visits except acquaintances who truly desired to befriend him, and especially those who brought him wine. When he gets drunk faster than his guests, he would simply tell them to leave so he could sleep, and he would spend all the money he received from a friend as prepaid credits on a bar rather than on food. 
While nowadays we designate such behaviors as alcoholism, I wonder how drinking was viewed at his time, and how should we understand Tao's alcoholism in relation to his status as a recluse and a poet? Yes.、Um, The extant biographies of Tao Yuanming are filled with such anecdotes about his、uh, drinking, love of drinking.、Um, the ancient Chinese, in fact, rarely viewed habitual wine drinking pejoratively as alcoholism. Quite to the contrary, in early medieval China, drinking had become a defining part of elite culture. Social outings and gatherings would include intellectual discussion, poetry composition, and drinking wine, and lots of it. In certain cases, a man's drinking might even be construed as a tempered form of political protest or a muted gesture to mark some sort of unspeakable distress. This was, in fact, the dominant reading of the famous scholar official Ran Ji. Who lived about 150 years before Tao Yuanming? Ran Ji was said to have taken to wine bibbing, and to have played the role of the drunkard during a turbulent era, when one powerful and ruthless family was poised to replace the ruling dynasty. In the same vein, Tao Yuanming's liberal alcohol consumption was seen by many later readers as protest and distress over the rise of a military man, then poised to oust the ruling family and supplant the dynasty under which Tao Yuanming was born and presumably loyal to. Well, perhaps Tao Yuanming was such a loyalist who drank and drank. In order to leave his mark of noble protest, and to indicate in a culturally accepted sign his disapproval of current politics, certainly many of his readers would like to believe that was the case, and there is no good reason to debunk that reading. But Tao Yuanming himself would tell you in his poetry that he saw wine as what he would call "quote unquote" the care dispelling thing. We can ask what cares. Maybe it was the troubled political times, but surely, his decision to renounce his worldly ambition, his decision to withdraw from government service, and to live a life of poverty—surely those were his cares that、uh, that plagued him from time to time. Because to withdraw from government service at the time. And to subsist on your own through farming, for instance, that was not an easy decision to make. And in one poem of his, in which he praises the dignity and honor of impoverished gentlemen of the past, Tao Yuanming obliquely references the resentful words he gets at home, presumably from his wife and his sons, who were made to live his choice of poverty. Right. What are the major conventional modes of reading Tao Yuanming, and what is the new way of reading him, as you proposed in your monograph? Well, since the 11th century, and that would be the Song Dynasty, through the promotion of several influential poet critics, Tao Yuanming's poetry has come to embody the supreme ideals of spontaneity and naturalness. Spontaneous and natural. Has remained one of the dominant ways of interpreting Tao Yuanming's poetry, and here I think, for illustration, I would like to discuss as an example one of his most famous poems, and、um, not surprisingly, it is entitled "Drinking Wine." This is the fifth one in a series of twenty poems. That is great. Actually, I love it. It's one of my favorite. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, it it is it is a beloved poem, and、um, many Chinese can recite this by heart. That's right. So I will read、uh, my English translation of it. I built my hut in the midst of men, yet hear no clamor of horse and carriage. You ask, how can it be done? With the mind detached, place becomes remote. Plucking chrysanthemums by the eastern hedge, at a distance I catch sight of the southern mountain. The mountain air becomes lovely at sunset, as flying birds return together in flocks. In these things there is true meaning. I wish to explain 
but have forgotten the words. The wow. most famous couplet. I know it's it's <laughs> moving every time I I read、uh, and think about this poem. Yeah, the most famous couplet comes in the middle of the poem. The couplet, the 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 two lines,、mm-hmm. plucking chrysanthemums by the eastern hedge. At a distance, I catch sight of southern mountain. The internal connection between these two lines is the theme of long life. The chrysanthemums is an ingredient for long life elixirs, and the southern mountain is a Chinese cultural symbol of long life. So there is this spontaneous nexus of meaning that happened just in a daily activity of Tao Yuanming. To just happen to catch sight of something, rather than attempting to find something, indicates a lack of intentionality. And for Chinese readers, this exemplifies spontaneity. So, in other words, you're not actively trying to see something, find something. So, this attribute of spontaneity was so much. Part of the Taoyuanming brand, that a competing version of the text that circulated in the Song Dynasty with a variant to gaze at Wang instead of to catch sight of Jian, was somewhat merrily dismissed by later editors, critics, and readers, because according to their line of reasoning, to gaze at Wang would suggest intentionality. Which a spontaneous and natural poet such as Tao Yuanming surely could not have meant. They would say Tao Yuanming simply poured out what was within him, without any thought of using language to craft literary works. So, for about a millennium, this interpretation of Tao Yuanming and his poetry as being utterly and absolutely spontaneous and natural. And uncrafted, had created blinders to reading and appreciating the full range of his poetic art. For centuries, critics, by and large, ignored earlier textual sources for Tao Yuanming's poetry, and saw instead his works as utterly and absolutely original in their spontaneous creation. My recent book on early medieval Chinese poetry and philosophy and their intersection. Demonstrates that Tao Yuanming did not, in fact, create from within a vacuum of spontaneous genius. He himself was an intertext. His works are a lacework of many other texts. He read earlier texts such as the Zhuangzi and the Analects, and was familiar with the Chinese philosophical and literary traditions.、Mm-hmm. And He in fact used them in his own literary production. So, in my recent book, I argue that instead of searching for Tao Yuanming's originality in imputedly unique inventions, we ought to inquire into how he deliberately selected from and creatively used cultural forms that were available to him to produce texts that are of his own distinct design and composition. Right. What were the literary canons in six dynasties? Ones that dismissed Tao Yuanming's works as mediocre, and how did he get recognized by Tang Song poets? And what are the social and literary conditions that witnessed a major shift in Tao's reception? Do you think? Well, it might be interesting for our viewers to know that Tao Yuanming was not always considered to be a great poet. A natural, spontaneous poet. In fact, critics and readers during his own time saw him primarily as an eccentric or a lofty recluse who happened to write poetry that was often confused with the words of a mere farmer. Natural was only articulated as a defining attribute of Tao Yuanming's works about five hundred years into his reception. History during the Song Dynasty. Now, this was not because naturalness did not exist as an aesthetic term or concept during Tao Yuanming's time, since, for example, 
naturalness was applied by early medieval Chinese writers to the poetry of Tao Yuanming's contemporary Xie Lingyun, who has now since come to epitomize the exquisite craft and artfulness that's celebrated. We hope you have enjoyed the episode so far. If you want to hear the entire episode, you can subscribe at theglobalnovel.com/slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening.